couple of weeks ago, we started a series on the book of Mark, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And so we're looking at Mark chapter 2 this evening, and let's take our body. When you find the place, let's stand for the reading of God's word. And we'll read this evening from Mark chapter 2, verse 1, down to verse number 22. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 to 22. <clears throat> and again he entered into Capernaum after some days. Remember last week uh, or last time we saw that after the healing of the leper, he wasn't able anymore to enter publicly into any city. So uh, they're coming to him from the desert places. So he's trying to sneak back into Capernaum, you might say. But it says in verse 1, And it was noised that he was in the house. He couldn't hide. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born afore. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never sought on this fashion. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus. That's, his name is called Matthew in other places. He's Matthew who wrote the first gospel. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast, and they come and say unto him, Why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. No man also soweth a piece of, a new, of new cloth on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled and the bottles will be marred, but new wine 
must be put into new bottles. We'll only read that far this evening, but this evening we're considering the Son of God and sinful men. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that we're considering this evening as we think of our Savior, the Son of God, coming into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. We're so thankful that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. And as we see him this evening, walking by the Sea of Galilee, calling a publican to follow him. As we see him, he, uh, not just healing the man of his palsy, but forgiving his sins. I pray, Lord, that we'll see what a wonderful Savior we have. And if there's someone who doesn't know him, who doesn't know the forgiveness of sins, I pray that one will be saved tonight. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. One spring, a farmer was having problems with crows. They were starting to pull up his corn. And uh, so the farmer said, I know exactly what I'm going to do. And he took his shotgun and he marched out into the fields and he started to shoot at the crows. And he got about three or four of them. But he also wounded his family's pet parrot. And so he comes back home holding this parrot and his children see the pet parrot in the dad's hand say, Daddy, what happened? Who would be so cruel to do this to our parrot? And the parrot, before the farmer could answer, the parrot simply said, bad company, bad company. <laughs> Anyways, I'm sorry for squawking like that, but, you know, bad company, you know, he was in bad company. You know, he was, parrot was hanging out with the crows. What's he doing there? Well, you know, that's nothing compared to what we have in our text. In our text, we have the sinless, spotless Son of God eating with publicans and sinners. We have the sinless Savior, the pure one, the one who the angels are around his throne singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Sitting in a house filled with sinful men. What, what is this? that the sinless Son of God would come into this world full of sinners. What is he doing with sinners? Well, I'm glad you asked, because this chapter, we see all kinds of things that our Savior does with sinful men. What does our Savior do for sinners? Well, we see in our first part of our text, uh, with sinful men, number one, our Savior, he forgives their sins. Our text begins in verses 1 to 5 with the story of this man who is brought to Jesus, the lame man who is brought to Jesus. Just look at those verses again. It says in verse 1, And again he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noise that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together, insomuch that there was no room to receive them, no, not so much as about the door. And he preached the word unto them. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where, or sorry, I, I skipped a verse there. And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And I'll stop reading right there. But as our text begins, our Savior, he's, he snuck his way back into the city. He's going back to the city where he's so far been in desert places with all the multitudes coming to him. But now he's come back to Capernaum. He's back in the house. What house is it? Well, I suppose it was Peter's house. Because in context, in chapter 1, he was in Peter's house. And all the city was gathered together at the door of Peter's house. And now he's back in Capernaum. And it's noise that once again, he's in the house. He's back in Capernaum, back where he was. And all the people hear that he's there. And they come to see our Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he do with this great multitude? He preaches the word unto them. They were hungry for the gospel. They were hungry for the word of God. And our Savior preached to them the word. But as he's preaching, there's, a, there's an interruption. In the middle of his message, these four young men, I assume they're young because I assume that an older man would be too wise to do this. But these four men, they start to take apart the roof where they're at. Because there's this layman that needs to get to Jesus. In verse 3 to 5, 
And they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born afore. When they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Here's this man who, simply put, he needed Jesus. He couldn't walk. He has a palsy. He has a condition. He's paralyzed is what the palsy means. He can't get to Jesus on his own. So his friends had to bring him to the Savior. You know, this layman is a picture of sinners. And our sin, this layman, he couldn't work to save himself. He couldn't work to get him his own way to Jesus. He needed to be brought. And so it is. The layman can't walk. He can't do anything to save himself. He's incapable of obtaining his own salvation. The only way is if someone else will, will bring him to the Savior. And you know, we need to follow the example of these friends, don't we? These four friends, they have a friend that needed Jesus. They carried him. And it would have been easier if they had a, if they had a car to put him in. It would have been easier if they, maybe, may, maybe they could have had a, a horse and chariot or something. But that's not what the text says. The text says they carried him. He was born of four. Four men, one grabbed each a corner of his mat and carried him to Jesus. And they were persistent, weren't they? I mean, they get to the house and they see the crowds. They see the press, the Bible calls it. They see all this multitude around the door and they're not able to get into the house through the main door. So they went home and said, we'll try again tomorrow. They said, okay, well, we'll come back another day. No, they, they climbed up on top of the house, on top of the roof, and began to break it apart so they could get this one to Jesus. What are you willing to do to get someone to Jesus? How persistent are you willing to be? What are you willing to attempt to tell someone about the Savior and to get them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so there they are. Our Savior's in the middle of preaching, and they start breaking up the roof. Now, I, it's Peter's house, I assume. I wonder what he thought of it. I wonder what his wife thought of it. Better yet, I wonder what his mother-in-law thought of it. As uh, there it is, and the, and the, these men just start digging a hole in the top of his roof. But he's let down into the presence of Jesus. And uh, he's there to be healed. That is the purpose of his visit. This man cannot walk, and his friends have brought him to Jesus so that he can be healed of his palsy, so he can arise and walk. And while our Lord is no doubt about to heal him, what does he do first? He says in verse 5, Son, Thy sins be forgiven thee. First and foremost, he forgives his sins. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus is come into the world, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He forgives sins. And this text reminds me that this is most important. This is first. This man was there for the healing of his palsy, and he was going to get healed. The Lord was going to raise him up and tell him to take up his bed and walk. But what good would it have been to rise him up from his palsy and for him to go home in the same spiritual condition as when he came? What good would it have been for this man to have been physically healed and still be lost in sin? And our Savior, first and foremost, he came into this world to save us from our sins. And listen, if you've never been to Jesus, you need to come to him. You need him. Jesus is able to help you. He's able to help you on life's road. He's able to solve problems. He's able to answer prayer. He's able to heal the sick. He's able, he's able to work in your everyday life. Well, first and foremost, you need to come to Jesus because you need to be forgiven of sins. And as a Christian... We see people struggling, and we say, if only we could get them to Jesus. 
If only we get to them to Jesus, that one would stop drinking. If ever we could just get them to Jesus, they'd have power to have, to have self-control. If only we could just get them to Jesus, there would be peace in that home. It will bring contentment to that life. But number one reason is still we need to get them to Jesus so they can have forgiveness of sins. Because they're lost on the way to hell because they've sinned against God and they need to find forgiveness that comes through Jesus Christ. And it's interesting to note that in Matthew, there's actually in the Gospel of Matthew and the account of this miracle, Matthew has one more line written than Mark. Uh, Matthew says, when he said in, in Mark verse chapter 2, verse 5, our Savior says, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But in Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, our Savior says, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Be of good cheer. Why does he say, be of good cheer? I believe that statement in Matthew gives us an insight into how this lame man was feeling and that he needed to be cheered up. He needed to have some encouragement. He was down because of his sin. We read in the text that these four men, they brought him to Jesus and we read in the text of their faith. Jesus saw their faith and we read in the text there and are encouraged by the four friends who teamed up to bring him to Jesus. But have you ever thought what the layman was thinking? Ever thought what was going on in his head? You know, I wonder, we've mentioned before, in those days, disabilities like being lame, people would have that kind of ailment and they considered it to be a judgment from God. They considered it to be something that they deserved because of something that they had done, because of some sin that they had committed. And perhaps in this man's case, perhaps he was very mindful of his own sin. Perhaps he was very mindful of what he had done against a holy God. And as his friends brought him to Jesus, I can just see him there thinking, what's the point? Why are you guys doing all this for me? Why are you guys putting all this work and trying to get me to, to the healer when he's not going to heal me anyways? I'm too much of a sinner to be healed. There, I, I'm, I'm lame because I deserve to be lame. There's no way he's going to heal me. But all his fears and all his anxiety flees away when Jesus says, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. He forgave him his sin. And what he did for him is what he does for all sinful men when they come to Jesus. He takes, has, has sin taken away your joy of living? Are you bound by sin? You're not alone, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But Jesus Christ offers forgiveness of sin. He came into this world to save sinners of whom I am chief. He forgives the sin of sinful men. What does he do for sinful men? Number one, he forgives their sin. And secondly, I want you to note in verses 6 to 12, that not only does he forgive our sins, but number two, he gives us new life. He gives us new life. You know, that praise the Lord, this text doesn't end with verse 5, with the man just having his sins forgiven. As wonderful as that is, I'm glad there's verses 6 to 12. I'm glad ultimately he takes up his bed and walks. Verse number 6, but there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why doth this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things in your hearts? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and take up thy bed and walk, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed, and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. I just want to make a blanket statement. When Christ saves someone, he changes them too. 
If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He doesn't just come in and keep things the way they are. He makes all things new. He makes a difference. And for this man who was lame, this man who comes to Jesus, Jesus wasn't just going to save him from his sins. He wasn't just going to forgive him. He was going to, as we say when we baptize someone, raise them up to walk in newness of life. He's going to give him new feet. He's going to give him new life, a new, a new lease on life as he was able to take his bed and walk out of there. And what we see in the text is that this miracle was the proof that his sins were forgiven. This miracle proved that the Son of Man had indeed forgiven his sins. You see, in our text, we, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they knew exactly what's going on here. When, they, when the Savior says, thy sins be forgiven thee, they understand. That's a big statement. That's something that only God can do. That's something that only, only the eternal God is, is capable of doing, is forgiving a man's sins. Remember, Mark's gospel is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And our Savior was fully aware of the statement he was making when he said, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But the Pharisees were questioning it, questioning what was going on. And our Savior says to them simply, What's easier, to say thy sins be forgiven thee, or take up thy bed and walk? But he says in verse 10, But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. He saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, and take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. This was the proof. The miracle was the proof that his sins were forgiven. They saw this man's forgiven, man forgiven of his sins, walking and carrying his bed. And that's when they glorified God, saying, we never saw it on this fashion. And it proved to them that Jesus Christ did forgive his sins. And it's the same proof today for the world around us. How does the world know that the, what's the evidence that we present to the world that the gospel works? What's the evidence that we present to the, God, to the world that heaven is real, that salvation is real, that the Lord Jesus Christ is the Savior of men? What's the evidence that we give to them? It's the power of a changed life. It's when someone comes to Christ and they get saved and they become a new creature. It's when they start living differently. It's when they start to change. It's the fact that we were lame, we were incapable of doing right, incapable of choosing the right path, incapable of having victory. But Christ Jesus has given us newness of life, made us to walk in newness of life. And this lame man is a picture of one who is now living above with Christ, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. He's a picture of one who has received new life in Christ. And as one man put it, he went to Jesus with his head on his bed, and he left with his, be with his bed on his head. <laughs> and uh, it was a miracle that raised the roof. It turned it all upside down in his life. Changed it all completely because he had come to Jesus. Jesus didn't just forgive him his sins. He gave him, gave him new life. What he does for sinners is he forgives our sins and gives new life in Christ. And we're going to keep going this evening with the next sinner in our text, Levi, the son of Alphaeus, also called Matthew. What does the Lord do with sinful men? He forgives their sin. He gives them new life. And the next one might shock us, but number three, he calls them into service. He calls them. In verse 13 to 14, we're introduced to a, a man that we would have considered to be a great sinner. And he went forth again by the seaside, and all the multitude resorted unto him, and he taught them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Elpheus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose and followed him. This man, Levi, the son of Alphaeus, he is Matthew. I don't know if Alphaeus is the same Alphaeus who is the father of Judas, not Iscariot. I don't know if, he's this, if they're brothers or not, but 
Oh, the Lord knows. But what's he doing sitting at the receipt of custom? What's his business there? Well, he's a publican. He's a man that collects taxes of the children of Israel. He's an Israelite who is working for the Romans. The publicans were, were well known for their dishonesty. They were well known for their greed. They were well known for taking advantage of their own people and, and charging them extra taxes and, and forcing them to, and becoming rich off of what they stole. And they were known to be great sinners. In fact, in Luke chapter 18, when the Pharisee went to pray next to the publican, he just simply thanked God that he wasn't a publican because they had such a terrible reputation. And here was a publican, a man so with such a terrible reputation that none of the children of Israel wanted to associate with them. Nobody wanted to have anything to do with them. No one wanted to, to, to spend any time with them. But Jesus comes and calls them to follow me. He says, follow me to Matthew the publican. He's a tax collector, a sinful man, a servant of sin. He's been yielding his members for years as unto the Romans, uh, yielding his members to sin. But now Jesus calls him to yield his members as instruments to righteousness. Jesus comes and calls him into service. He calls him and asks him to play a major role in the army of the Lord. And that's amazing. Not just that God would forgive a sinner, not just that he would give him new life, but then that he'd use him. That he'd say, you'd be, you be my, my worker. You'd be my disciple. You'd be someone that ministers to me and takes part in the Lord's work. No, that's, that's what grace is. That's God's grace. God's grace that he takes sinners like you and me and use us for his glory. The fact is we're, we're all sinners, aren't we? These two men that we were considering tonight, the, the, the layman and Matthew, they're just like you and me. They're just people. They're people that are fallen people, people that have sinned, people that have gotten, that have, that, that have gone down the wrong road, people that have committed wickedness against God. And yet God forgives their sin and calls them into service. There's a story of a man that was in jail. His name was Valentine Burke, and he was a well-known burglar. And he was in jail in St. Louis, and he was awaiting trial. And uh, the newspaper headline caught his eye. The newspaper headline said, Jailer at Philippi Caught. I guess he liked hearing about a jailer getting caught, seeing as they were the ones keeping him in prison. So he read the article, only to find that it was the sermon of D.L. Moody that he had preached in that city just days before. And so he read it, and he was getting upset as he read it. But over and over again, he kept reading the words, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And I'm told that that prisoner, Valentine Burke, he got down on his knees in that prison and asked for forgiveness of sins, and he was a changed man. Say, when he got out of prison, he went to New York City wanting to start over, wanting to live an honest life. But he was a former burglar, and nobody would hire him. Nobody wanted anything to do with Valentine Burke. And so finally, he returned back to St. Louis. And when he got back to St. Louis, they, they, the police came and they called him into headquarters. And they informed him that while he was in New York, the police had actually shadowed him and reported that he had proved himself to be straight and honest. And they hired him to, uh, to take, later Moody visited him and he had a new position where he was guarding some treasured jewels. And uh, when D.L. Moody saw him, he said, look, they trust me to guard them. See what the grace of God has done for a burglar. He went from being a thief to guarding the jewels. And that's what Jesus did for us. He took us from, like Paul, from being enemies of God, persecutors of the church, being ones that were, that were just sold under sin. 
and now he's called us into his service. He's called, not only saved us by grace, but he's called us onto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Paul's testimony in 1 Timothy. Let's read that. 1 Timothy chapter 1. Just a few books over. Say half the New Testament over, not a few books. 1 Timothy chapter 1. And verse number 12, Paul says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But he was before a blasphemer, persecutor, injurious. But God put him into the ministry. And that's what God does for sinners. We're sinners saved by grace. God saves us. He gives us new life. And he calls us into service. You know, we serve him together. We're all just standing next to each other. Sinners saved by grace. It's interesting that our Savior, where does he call Levi? He calls him by the Sea of Galilee. He's walking by the sea. He's teaching by the sea. And as he passes by, he sees Levi, the son of Alphaeus. Why is he sitting by the sea? Well, it's believed that he would sit by the sea because he was the publican for those who had business in the sea. And uh, you know that there's a couple of disciples that had business at the sea. There was a guy named Peter, a guy named Andrew, and James and John who most likely, Levi or Matthew, was their publican. He was their Roman who was constantly taking advantage of them and, and making them pay extra taxes. And now they're side by side serving the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the grace of God. That's the grace of God that takes a sinner and puts him into service. He saves them, forgives their sin, gives them new life, enlists them into service. And then number four, he goes even a step further. He fellowships with them. He spends time with them. Matthew's a new man. And so in verse 15, it says, And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And when the scribes and Pharisees saw him eat with publicans and sinners, they said unto his disciples, How is it that he eateth and drinketh with publicans and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Comes to Matthew. So here we have an alarming scene. We see our Savior going into the house of a publican. Some places you just don't go. I'd say a publican's house would be one of them. Why is he going down into a publican's house? You see him, he went in there. He sat down. He's eating at that table. And not only is one publican there, the one who lives there, but he's invited all his publican friends and all his, all his sinner friends. And they're all gathering together and eating with the Savior and his disciples. And to the Pharisees, this action was unacceptable. How could he, a holy man of God, tarnish his reputation by sitting with these publicans, with these people? How could he, a, a teacher of the people, contaminate himself with their presence? You see, what he's doing is something that the Pharisees would never dream of doing. They would never dream of identifying or sitting down with sinners. But our Savior isn't them. Our Savior's the sinner's friend. He's not ashamed to call us his brethren. He doesn't just forgive us our sins. He doesn't just give us new life. He doesn't just enlist us into service. But he sits us at his table and kills the fatted calf and sits down with us and rejoices. And we all have a spot with him at the Father's table. Now listen, some people take this text and go so far to say Christians can go to Terrible places. These guys that he's sitting with, that he's fellowshipping with, 
they're not publicans and sinners anymore. It says in the text, they're followers of him. In verse number, uh, verse number 15, and it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. And verse 17 makes it clear. Our Savior calls sinners to repentance. Came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. But sinners saved by grace. Us who were lost in sin, saved by the grace of God. Our Savior comes in and communes with us. Remember Revelation chapter 3, verse 20? is talking to a church. Talking to Christians who our Savior wanted to have fellowship with. And he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him and he with me. I don't know if that was chocolate bar worthy or not, but I feel like it was pretty good. I might just go get one after the service. I'm just kidding. But our Savior fellowships with sinners, gives us new life, and sits us down at his table. Then there's one more thing I want to conclude with this evening. Verses 18 to 22. What does our Savior do with sinful men? Not only does he uh, forgive their sins and give them new life and, and call them to service and fellowship with them, but in verse 18 to 22, he fills their hearts with joy. In verse 18, the disciples, and John, the disciples of John and the Pharisees are together. That seems like a weird combination. You ever think, I mean... They thought it was weird to see the publicans and, and sinners with the Lord. Well, it's even weirder to think of the Pharisees with the disciples of John. Didn't John call the Pharisees a generation of vipers? Didn't the Pharisees refuse to go to the, or refuse the baptism of John, rejected it? But here they are together because they have a common question. They say, Lord, why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast? but thy disciples fast not. Well, the Pharisees, they fasted for show. John's disciples, they fasted because of repentance of sin. They fasted because of their sin, and they fasted because they recognized that they were sinners and mourned their sin. So why aren't the Lord's disciples fasting as well? But Jesus says in verse 19, Jesus said unto them, can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then they shall fast. Why don't they fast? Well, I believe they don't fast because they have the Savior, but because their sins are forgiven. John's disciples, they're fasting, mourning sin, repenting of sin. But why would the Lord's disciples who have the Savior from sin right there with them, why do they need to fast? Now listen, I just want to make this clear. The Bible is pro-fasting. And there are some among us who should fast more often than they do. And uh, we won't go any further with that statement. But the Bible is pro-fasting. But... In this text, at least there's one among us, okay? We'll just go with one. Uh, um, our Savior is just simply saying, this isn't the time for them to fast. They just met the Savior. They have the Lord with them. Why would they go around mourning and fasting when this is time to rejoice? Now is the day of good news. Now is the day of the gospel. Now is the day of forgiveness of sins. After all, since when did you go to a, a wedding and mourn and fast? It's not something you do there. You don't go to a wedding and fast. Now, maybe there's some people that are so on a diet, they go there and they don't eat maybe, but that's not typically how it works, okay? When you go to a wedding, it's a, it's a feast. And the disciples, they had the bridegroom. They had the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would they fast? They had the Lamb of God who has washed their sins away. Why would they be mourning? He's taken away the sin of the world. So why should they be sad? The time would come when they'd fast, when the Savior would be taken away from them, and there would be times they need to fast. There are times we need to fast today. Jesus even says in Mark 9, when the disciples couldn't do a miracle, such only comes by prayer and fasting. But in this case, 
there was no need to mourn for their sin because they had the savior of sins from sins right there. And this was something new. This was something that the law could not do. Look at what the Savior says in verse 21. No man also soweth a piece of new cloth and on an old garment, else the new piece that filled it up taketh away from the old, and the rent is made worse. The new cloth is the New Testament, the new relation, the relationship we have with Christ, the forgiveness of sins through grace, by grace through faith. The old garment's the law. It's that old way, the Judaism way. And uh they, they're trying to, the Pharisees were trying to fit this into that. And the Lord's saying they don't go together. They're different. I'm bringing in something new. And he expands on that in verse number 22. It's not religion, it's a relationship. In verse 22, he says, And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred, but new wine must be put into new bottles. The wine is a picture of the Holy Ghost. In the Bible, he's a picture of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is given to believers. He's poured into the new man. You don't, uh, he doesn't come into the old man. The illustration is of, is of the wine being poured into new bottles, not old bottles. So ruin the bottles. Well, if the Holy Spirit came into the old man, what good would that do? It's a new man. There's a new man in Christ Jesus. And what's it a picture of? Wine's a picture of not just the Holy Spirit, but it's a picture of the joy of the Holy Ghost. Now listen, there's lots to say about wine, and I'm anti-alcohol, and I won't go into that this evening. But in this text, it's just simply a picture of the Holy Ghost and the joy that he gives. And the Lord's saying... I, why are my disciples fasting? It's because they got the joy of the Lord. It's because they got something new. It's because they've just been saved. It's because they found new life in Christ. And so why would they be mourning? Our Savior has filled their heart with singing. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. And we're rejoicing. He makes the sinner able to sing. You know, we saw that this morning. The angels, they're saying with a loud voice. They're not able to sing. I don't know why they don't sing, but it doesn't have them singing anywhere that I can find in the Word of God. But the redeemed, they sung a new song because that's the joy of salvation. That's the joy of redemption. Our Savior doesn't just forgive our sins, doesn't just give us new life, doesn't just call us into service, doesn't just fellowship with us, seat us at his table, but he fills our cup to overflowing. He fills us with joy. And that's how he treats every single sinner that comes to him by faith. I wonder, have you come to him? You say, I'm too much of a sinner. Well, that's just it. He came to save sinners of whom I am chief. There was a lady by the name of Charlotte Elliott. She was a, she, she was a lady who was a little obstinate, not very interested, it seemed, in becoming a Christian. But she asked Caesar Milan, I guess was his name, how she could become a Christian. The old man replied, my dear, it's very simple. Just come to Jesus. And she said, well, I'm a very great sinner. Will he take me just as I am? And he said, yes, he'll take you just as you are. And she said, if he'll take me just as I am, then I'll come. And she went home, sat at her desk, and wrote the beautiful words of the song, Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as you are. Come as a sinner. He's the sinner's friend. He'll forgive sin, give new life, call into service, fellowship with you, and fill your heart with joy. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that we considered this evening. Thank you, Lord, for the new life that Jesus gives, for the forgiveness of sins and all the blessings we have in Christ. I pray, Lord, this evening that there's, if there's someone that doesn't know him as their Savior, I pray that they'll be saved today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.